How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Gianluca and I'm a final year medical student studying in Canada. Earlier this month, I passed the step one exam and then I made a vlog going over what my step one test day experience was like and I shared that here on YouTube. I also made a plan and posted that as to how I studied and passed the exam on my first try. And then to wrap it all up today with the last video, I'm gonna be going over 10 things that I think everyone should cram or just make sure this is at the top of their minds going into the last few days right before test day. Now, obviously you can't cram for the step one exam. It's not gonna happen. If you're like two weeks away, you haven't started studying, um, it's not looking good for you in my opinion, but that's not what this video is about. I'm not trying to stress anyone out. This is not gonna be extensive, complicated subjects. This is just lists mostly 10 very important things I think you should study. And if you have any extras, go ahead and leave them in the comment section below. Anything that you think is super high yield, I want this video to be a place where people could come a few days before their exam and see some high yield tips they could just grab and take with them going into the exam. So hopefully that's what we're doing today. Now, the first thing is gonna be one of the most important things that I did going into the exam. I actually took some time out of the first question block to make sure that I had this written down in front of me from memory and that is the biostatistics formula sheet. So I'll have my formula sheet up on the screen right now. What's very important and what helped me remember this sheet to use was to remember things by grouping. So first of all, you'll see the little T table right there. Make sure you arrange A, B, C, and D and to memorize what goes on top and what goes on the bottom. Top is gonna to be the positive statements and then the bottom is gonna be the negative statements. On the top, you're gonna to have your true positives and then your false positives and then the bottom is gonna be your false negatives and then your true negatives. Now, as far as remembering the other parts of the sheet, again, I use grouping. I group sensitivity and specificity together and then I grouped positive predictive value and negative predictive value together and then odds ratio kind of went by itself along with number needed to treat. So the second point is going to be the single gene mutation disorders and what I need you to memorize here is the disease and some hallmarks of the disease and then the gene that is mutated to cause the disease and then finally the inheritance pattern of that mutation that causes the disease. Now I'm going to try and break up the list between the autosomal dominance and the autosomal recessive. So to go in order we have Marfan syndrome at the top, autosomal dominance caused by mutation FBN. Next, we have osteogenesis imperfecta, autosomal dominant, caused by a mutation in COL1A, and then there's one and two. Then there's achondroplasia, uh, autosomal dominant, caused by a mutation in the FGFR3 gene. Then there is Huntington's disease, once again, um, autosomal dominant, caused by a mutation in the HTT gene. And then finally, we have PKD, so polycystic kidney disease. This one here could be either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. Um, so just remember, it is a mutation. There's both varieties. Now for the recessives, we have cystic fibrosis, CFTR uh, gene. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is X-linked recessive, and it's in the dystrophin gene. Then we have Fragile X, uh, that's caused by a mutation in the FMR1 gene, that is X-linked recessive. And then finally, we have PKU, and that is in the PKH gene, once again, autosomal recessive. Point number three is the Dirty Medicine Guide to Interpreting Peripheral Blood Smears for the Leukemias. This one's gonna be the dirty, you know, down to basics type of review for it. And make sure to arrange everything in a spectrum so you help remember the ages too. So on both sides of the line, we have ALL affecting the very young kids, and then we have CLL affecting the very old people. And in the center, we have CML, so just to the right of ALL. And right after that is going to be AML, mostly affecting people around the age of 45 to 60. Now remember that CML is associated with a translocation of nine and chromosomes 922. Uh, AML is the translocation of 15, 17. Then ones that are not on the line, Burkitt's lymphoma, remember that, that has the association of being caused by Epstein-Barr virus and is linked to the MYC proto-oncogene with the translocation 814. Then you have mantle cell lymphoma, which is uh, affecting cyclin D1, and that is a translocation of 1114. And then finally, you have follicular T cell lymphoma. Um, BCL2 is the gene, and that is the translocation of 14 and 18. And the last high yield tip from that whole section is that our rods specifically are associated with AML. Our rods, AML, keep that in mind. Point number four are going to be the fetal toxin exposures. And from this list, you're trying to listen for buzzwords. So for alcohol, remember dysmorphic facies, growth retardation, CNS abnormalities. For cocaine, preeclampsia, placental abruption, and fetal demise, which is a big one. The anti-epileptics are going to be causing neural tube defects, 
as well as skeletal and cleft palate abnormalities. Antipsychotics usually are safe for babies and for fetal exposure. Don't get this confused with paroxetine. You do not give paroxetine to people that are pregnant. Then ACE inhibitors finally are going to be causing the limb deformities, oligohydraminose, IUGR, and finally the renal dysplasia, all of these things are with the ACE inhibitors. One final thing to note is that heparin is safe in pregnancy. Remember that one, heparin is safe in pregnancy. Point number five now, in keeping with the same type of feeling that we just have with point number four, these are the torch infections. And some buzzwords to remember for the different torch infections, when we have toxoplasmosis, in order to clue into that, you're looking for the blueberry rash, which is common in a few of them, but hydrocephalus, which is the big one. Rubella, specifically, you will be looking for cataracts. So not being able to see or hear should be a clue in to maybe suspect rubella for babies. Um, CMV, you are looking for periventricular calcifications is the big one. You also see mononucleosis-like symptoms in either the mother or the baby. Sometimes you could have seizures, some hearing loss, some petechiae, but the periventricular calcifications are the one that usually clued me into CMV. Uh, HIV, you are looking into recurrent infections as well as sometimes diarrhea, but really the recurrent infections. Uh, HSV2 is encephalitis. And then finally, syphilis, you are looking for snuffles. If you see snuffles come up anywhere in that question stem, baby is sneezing, um, they sound congested when they breathe. You're also looking for possibly hydrops fatalis, as well as Hutchinson's teeth, which is the very distinct teeth pattern of babies that have the uh, fetal exposure to syphilis. Point number six is the catecholamine versus the serotonin synthesis pathways. Two very distinct pathways here. I'll have them up on the screen right now. The way that I remembered which amino acids went where is because phenylalanine and tyrosine, they both end in I-N-E, so I group those together, whereas tryptophan just sounds very different. That is how I remember that that one went with serotonin. Now, from the clinically important standpoint here, remember that uh, deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase is associated with PKU, so that is a block in the first step of the catecholamine synthesis pathway. Now also a bonus fact here with the neurotransmitters. Remember which brain regions contain which neurotransmitters for the most part. Sometimes that could come up in a practice question or on the actual test. The locus ceruleus is responsible for norepi. The raphe nuclei are serotonin. The nucleus accumbens specifically with dopamine and those few other areas with dopamine as well. And then finally, bonus bonus is that the Alzheimer's disease is specifically implicated with a disease process of the Mayan heart nucleus. All of these are important buzzwords. High yield tip number seven is another one from Dirty Medicine, and this is distinguishing the two types of adrenal congenital insufficiencies, 17 alpha hydroxylase insufficiency versus 21 hydroxylase deficiency, and it's going to be the going to college mnemonic. I will link his video so you can go and watch it yourself. But basically, just the high yield tips, 21 hydroxylase deficiency, you have decreased mineral corticoids, you have increased sex hormones, decreased blood pressure, decreased sodium, increased potassium. Then in 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, you have increased mineralocorticoids, decreased sex hormones, increased blood pressure, increased sodium, and decreased potassium. Point number eight is the cytochrome P450 activators and inhibitors, and cytochrome P450 is one of the most important enzymes to know for this exam, specifically for drug metabolism and hepatic clearance. So when it comes to the inhibitors, again, we're going to group a few things together. The A's, we have certain antibiotics, the azole antifungals, as well as amniodarone. Then we also have grapefruit juice, which is another very common one that you can see, and verapamil, and there's more that you're going to see, and you can make the list even more so, but those are some of the more common common ones. Then the inducers, you have carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, rifampin, St. John's wort, and modafinil. The very important detail to remember for this one is that alcohol is both an inhibitor and an inducer, an activator of cytochrome P450. So acute alcohol exposure is an inhibitor. You're acutely going to knock something out or knock someone out. That's how I would try and remember it. Um, someone that goes out binge drinking and then they pass out. So think of it like that. Versus when it comes to chronic exposure to alcohol, that is going to be an activator. Point number nine is going to be very, very high yield. These are easy marks for you to get. These are the study designs. So specifically, 
cohort versus case control. Remember that cohort studies are prospective. Two O's in cohort, one O in prospective. So make that association. Whereas case control is retrospective. Remember there is an E in case control. There's no E in cohort. Case control, remember the E. Retrospective, remember the E. Make that association. Now because there are two O's in cohort, that's relatively the same. Okay, those are going to show your relative risk. And a lot of these are dumb, but just remember it. Case control, A and E are at odds with each other. Thank you, Dirty Medicine. These ones here are going to show you your odds ratio. They are at odds with each other. Additional study types are the case series. Remember that is more like, when we talk about a case series, we typically have a few different individuals and we're just looking at what happened to those individuals. That's how I want you to think about that particular topic. You're not controlling anything. You're not moving any variables. You're just looking at what happened to these individual cases. And then finally, when they talk about cross-sectional studies, you need to think about prevalence. And the way that I remember that is because when I take a cross-section of a piece of tissue, I am looking at something Thing directly in that moment right now and that is prevalence that's how I made that association cross-sectional think I'm looking at it directly I'm looking at it right now things that are happening right now prevalence and finally high yield tip number 10 this is going to be the treatment for the different types of vaginal infections there are six that you need to remember bacterial vaginosis clindamycin or metronidazole trichomonas is going to be metronidazole Candida is going to be treated with uh, fluconazole, so remember it's a fungal infection. Then chlamydia, azithromycin, or doxycycline. And remember that for a second because then gonorrhea, so Neisseria gonorrhea, is going to be either ceftriaxone if it's just Neisseria gonorrhea, but more often than not, if you're suspicious of chlamydia, you're also going to add in doxycycline. So if you're suspicious of chlamydia with gonorrhea, then it's ceftriaxone plus doxycycline. And then finally, syphilis gets penicillin one shot of penicillin if possible. Okay, so I feel like that was a lot. We went over a lot right there in only those 10 items, but I promise you those are incredibly high yield. Money back refund right now to those of you that made it all the way through this video. If you don't see at least five points worth of questions on the topics that we just reviewed here, I will give you 100% of your money back for watching today's video. But if it did help you guys today, uh, I'd appreciate a like on the video. I'd appreciate you leaving a comment, letting me know that it was helpful for you. If you want to see anything else in the future, please let me know. Um, I am writing step two in about a month and yeah, it's about a month actually at this point. So we're going to talk about that at a future video. Studying is going well so far, just a sneak peek. I'm liking the step two material a lot better than the step one material. Um, and it's very similar to the Canadian exam, in my opinion, for the step two. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for coming out today. We will see you all in the next one. Best of luck with your exams and with studying. You're going to do great. And everyone take care.